you read that wrong. So, and that is what the text is that uh, we'll be preaching on this morning. So there is no gospel. Um, Colossians is the text that we're going to be in. So if you have your Bible, I'll invite you to pull it out and turn to Colossians 1. You can follow along and mark up your Bible or write notes if you have a note Bible. Um, or pull out a pew Bible. Otherwise, of course, as always, uh, we'll be pulling this text apart uh, verse by verse, <laughs> praise by praise. But again, sometimes it's easier to like put it all together if you can um, see it yourself. So we're starting a new series this morning. We're going to be going through the book of Colossians. Um, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible, number one, because it's short. <laughs> it's only four chapters long, and so you can easily just sit down and read it like a letter, like all of the epistles are, right? They are letters written, most of them written by the Apostle Paul, Peter, John, some others, but um, they're letters written to the various churches in Asia Minor as the Christian church was growing. And so you can just sit down and, you know, in a half hour, you no know, you know more than that, not even that, you can read this short book. Um, I also love it because it has some amazing uh, and profound truths about Jesus, about the supremacy of Jesus and his preeminence and um, just uh, that Jesus is above all things. That is, we'll find out a little bit more why it's about that, but uh, Paul just reiterates through the Colossians and, and really elevates Jesus in their lives. And not only that, but the last half of the, of the book then talks about transformation and the amazing transformation that happens in us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. So I actually did my Bible paper on Colossians 3, um, putting on our, our new life in Christ, putting off the old and putting on the new. So it's one of my favorite books, and um, this is where we're going to be spending much of our time this summer in the book of Colossians. Um, we're going to go over it section by section every week, and what we're going to be talking about this morning, we're going to be looking at the introduction, which Mary just read for us, and we're going to take that and apply it to intercessory prayer. Okay, that's our topic, is intercessory prayer. That's how Paul begins this letter, by interceding for the Colossians. What is intercessory prayer? It's basically coming before God on behalf of others. And it's coming before him, talking to him in prayer on behalf of someone else. That's intercessory prayer. So let me begin by asking you a question. How many of you would consider yourself to be an intercessor? Yeah, I see a few hands. Somebody that comes before God and talks to God on behalf of others. All right, some of you consider yourself to be an intercessor. Let me turn that around. How many of you would like to know that others are going to God on your behalf, talking to him about your request? Oh, yeah, the hands immediately went up. <laughs> so we want other people interceding for us. Right? Um, so, it, I saw a lot of hands, and that's a good thing, because that is what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be talking about intercessory prayer and how Paul can really teach us something here, because Paul was just one of the greatest intercessors ever. And in this particular instance, he begins his letter by interceding for the Christ followers who lived in the ancient city of Colossae. And Mary, you said that well, too. Huh? You must have looked it up, huh? How <laughs> you pronounce Colossae? Uh -huh. So let's start by, by giving, getting just a little bit of history um, on Colossae and, the, and the, the believers that lived there. Colossae was located, um, we've got a map up here, it was located about 100 miles inland uh, from the Aegean Sea in Asia Minor, which, is, which would be modern-day Turkey today. Okay, you can... Um, kind of see Greece, and then Italy, and you see Colossae. You see that over here on the right. So it, it was a very prominent city, um, actually one of the most important cities in the region in its day. 
uh, about 200 years before Paul came on the scene, Jesus and Paul came on the scene. Uh, during Paul's day, it, it, its prominence had faded a little bit, but it was still a very important city. Um, it had kind of been taken over by, not taken over, but Ephesus was, was kind of the dwelling city in Paul's day. But Colossae was still on a, uh, one of the major east-west trade roads, trade routes called the Royal Way, and so it was a very important city. Interestingly, um, Paul had never been to Colossae. He had never been there. However, he had lived in the city of Ephesus, which is about 80 miles to the west, and, and he lived in Ephesus for about three years. And it was during that time, while Paul was in Ephesus, that he made, met a guy named Ephesus. <coughs> Can you say that? Epaphras. E-P-E. We'll learn more about him. Um, but while Epaphras was in uh, Epaphras was in Ephesus, <laughs> uh, he met Paul, sat under his teaching, and he became a follower of Christ. He eventually went back to his hometown of Colossae, and he started a church there. Well, eventually, the church ran into some trouble which is what we find all throughout the New Testament, right? That's why Paul is writing to them. But Paul's teachers were starting to come around. We've talked about that extensively in the last couple of weeks. Um, but they were coming into Colossae, and uh, what they were doing in Colossae is that they were diminishing the role of Jesus in the daily lives of the Christ followers there. They were just kind of diminishing Jesus. And... Um, my papers are sticking together here. So we know that I have problems with the tape. Um, so this happens. Epaphras, a new Christian, he reaches out to his mentor, Paul, who was uh, in jail in Rome at the time for preaching the gospel. Asked Paul, you know, here's the situation. What do I do about this? And that's what resulted in Paul writing this letter to the Colossians, a group of people that he's never met before, but a letter that addresses the importance, the preeminence, and the supremacy of Jesus in our faith. So Paul begins this letter to the Colossians by introducing himself and letting them know that he has been praying for them, that he's their intercessor. Okay, And this is leading somewhere, but for now we're just going to talk about how Paul is interceding for the Colossians. So with that background in mind, let's go back and read again the opening verses of Colossians 1. Paul starts with an introduction. He just says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, so he's writing this with Timothy, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Verse 3, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. Now we're going to stop right there. And notice how Paul begins this letter to the Colossians. We're going to look at <clears throat> verse 3. Verses 1 and 2 is just introducing who's writing the letter, grace and peace to you in Jesus Christ. But then in verse 3, he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Okay, so the first thing that Paul does as he begins his intercession for the Colossians is he give, gives thanks to God. And that's the very first step to intercession, is giving thanks. You might say that it's kind of like the warm-up to intercessory prayer, because praying for people is actually hard work, isn't it? We kind of take on their burdens we shouldn't. We need to lift them to Christ, but it's hard work to bring the people that we love and care about to the Lord. And, and so it, it's important to kind of limber up our prayer muscles, you might say, by giving thanks to God. Um, so that you probably are aware that in the last months I joined CrossFit, and so I, I do CrossFit several mornings uh, a week. But the very first thing that we do is to warm up, right? We do some warm-up exercises. Their warm-up exercises are like medium <laughs> intensity for me, but they call them warm-up exercises. And, and that's really important, isn't it? It's really important because if you don't do your warm-up exercises, you're not going to go 
you're not going to get the benefit of um, the strength training and the other exercises that you do, you might get injured. And plus, your muscles are probably going to end up being really sore afterwards. Well, giving thanks is kind of like a warm-up to intercession. It's really the warm-up to all of our prayers. But if you've not considered yourself to be much of an intercessor, if you've never been much of a prayer for other people, it's maybe because you jump right in without first giving God thanks. Psalm 100, it was our responsive reading this morning, says that if you're going to come before the throne of God, that you're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. That's how we come before God. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. Why? Because it puts you in a right frame of mind. It gives you a right attitude in which to come before God. And so it is with intercessory prayer. Giving thanks puts us in a right frame of mind. It gives us a right attitude about the people that we're praying for. And it, and it helps us to pray them with fervency and enthusiasm for them. So Paul begins by giving thanks. What does he give thanks for? Three things. Three things that every believer, every person here today, every person can come before God and give thanks for these three things on any day. And this will help to get our, our prayer muscles limbered up. Okay? So first, Paul gives thanks for transformed lives. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Paul gives thanks for transformed lives. He was grateful for the, the way that God was working in the lives of the Colossians. Look again at verses 4 and 5. It says, We always thank God, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You see those three words there? Faith, hope, and love. Paul is thankful for the Colossians' faith that they had in Christ, for the love that they have for each other, and for the hope that they have. You see, not everything that Paul heard about the Colossians was bad. Yes, Epaphras, he was concerned about the false teaching that was coming into the church, but he also told Paul about the really good things that were happening among the believers. He said they have this tremendous faith in Jesus, and their, and their love for one another, for one another, you never met a more loving group of people. They are so welcoming to everyone and to, and to each other. They really, really love people. And their hope, their hope is truly in the promises of God. They're not all caught up in materialism. They set their sights on heaven, and their hope is in the Lord. So let me stop again and, and ask you, how often... Do you stop and thank God for what he is already doing in the lives of those around you? Huh? For, the, for, for the signs of faith and love and hope that you see in other people. I think you know that I pray for all of you on a regular basis. At least I hope you know that. And the very first thing that I do is I thank God for you. For bringing you into our fellowship. For what he is doing in your lives, and then I go on from there and pray for your needs. But that's the first thing that we want to do. It's kind of like the Henry Blackaby. You know, look to see where God is already at work and then join him in his work. We first, when we go to prayer, we thank God for what he is already doing in the lives of the people that we're praying for. The second thing that Paul thanks God for is the spread of the gospel. Pick it up at verse 5. And, um, it says, Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So, so Paul expresses to the Colossians how grateful he is that the gospel was spreading throughout the world, especially the fact that it was spreading through them, that it had come to them. You know, Paul was excited that the gospel was bearing fruit, not only in Colossae, but around the world, and, and, and for the many who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so the question, again, for us is, is does that get you excited? Huh? Does it, do you get excited when you see people coming to faith in Christ? Do you get excited when you see the gospel spreading through your life? 
as you, as you have opportunity to witness to other people? Do you get excited when you, when you see and hear the gospel is spreading through the ministry of First Lutheran Church? You know? Are, are, you, are you thankful when you hear what God is doing? It, as I talked this morning about our ministry partners, do you get excited when you hear what God is doing in and through them in Estonia and Congo and Mexico? You know, for both Pastor Seaman in Estonia and Pastor Bob, you may not realize this. You, you probably think that they have other big major churches sponsoring their ministries. They do not. First, First Lutheran Church in Hope, Minnesota is one of the primary support for Pastor Seaman and Pastor Bob. He, Pastor Bob was kind of, when I said that we were going to have this reception for him, he says, nope. Nobody else has done anything. Not even his own church. He said, first Lutheran, he considers you his brothers and sisters in Christ. We're one of his major supporters. But in and through their ministries, hundreds if not thousands of people have come to Christ. Primarily in the Congo, but thousands have come to Christ because of the ministry support and prayers that we offer up to God on their behalf. Does that excite you? Does that excite you? You know, it doesn't matter what color of skin they have. It doesn't matter what language they speak. Thousands have been added to the kingdom of God in part through the ministry of First Lutheran Church in Hope. That is amazing. And it, and it should be cause for us to come to God and just say, thank you, thank you, Lord, for doing that. So Paul thanks God for the transformed lives of the Colossians. He thanks God for the spread of the gospel. The third thing that he gives thanks for is the role of spiritual mentors in their lives, especially Epaphras. All right, look at verse 7. He says, Just as you have learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. That's a good sign of a leader when they build up another leader. So Paul is just building Epaphras up here as the primary mentor to the Colossians. He reminds them that Epaphras is the one who led them to Christ and <clears throat> nurtured their faith and who prays for them on a regular basis. If, if we jump ahead in Colossians to chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says that Epaphras is always struggling in prayer for you that you might stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. Wouldn't you love to have a mentor like Epaphras? I think we all would. Many of you, I'm sure, you can look back on your Christian life and you can identify mentors that helped you along the way, right? People who led you to Christ, people who taught you how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, <clears throat> someone who's been faithful to pray for you and, and encourage you. But when was the last time that you stopped to give God thanks for the mentors in your life? Hmm? Chances are, if you thank God regularly for those people, for those mentors in your life, it actually could possibly motivate you to become a mentor as well. All right? So... Paul begins by giving thanks. That's the warm-up. That's the warm-up. And that was the warm-up to my message. Now I'm ready to preach. All right? <laughs> Seriously. Um, once we've warmed up our prayer muscles by giving thanks to God for transformed lives and for the gospel spreading and for the spiritual mentors in our lives, we're now ready for the role of intercessor. So what do we pray for? when we're praying for others. You know, when we sit down to pray for our family, for our friends, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for our co-workers, for our neighbors, whoever it is, what do we pray? I would say that most of us, most of us we um, pray for people. When we pray for people, it's because they're having some crisis in their lives. And so we pray for that. Like we're praying for them because they're looking for work or because they're dealing with a serious illness or they're having mental health, health issues or whatever it is. That's what we're going to pray for. And that's wonderful. It's really important to pray for the, the difficulties that people are going through. But when it comes to intercession, it is so much more than that. Praying for their specific needs is just the tip of the iceberg because intercession is so much more. Intercession is praying not 
for people to just overcome the struggles that they're having, that they, that they would actually thrive, all right? That, that, that they live into everything that God has for them. And so we're going to look at four things that are at the top of Paul's prayer list. And by the end of this message, it's my hope that you'll have these four things memorized, all right? So you, again, you can take some notes here. But if you're going to be an intercessor for others, um, I would encourage you to memorize these four things. And the first one is fruit. Fruit, all right? <clears throat> so let's pick up where we left off, verse 9. Paul says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking, here we go, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. How do we do that? Now he's going to list four things. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. Okay, we're going to stop right there. So Paul says that he's going to be praying what is he going to be praying for? That they would, what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit in their lives. What does he mean by fruit? Is he talking about apples and pears and oranges? No. He's talking about what? He's talking about good works. Paul says, prays that they'll bear fruit in every good work. So one thing about fruit is that it's about good works. Fruit is caring for the poor. Fruit is figuring out ways to help people. Fruit is rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in a ministry here at church. Fruit is volunteering in your community. It's any good work that you do. Now, just a point of clarification, it seems like we always have to talk about this whenever we're talking about works and make sure that we understand that it's not our good works that save us, right? The only thing that saves us is putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, By grace you have been saved, not by works so that no one can boast, but by faith we are saved. However, if we keep reading there, we're not saved by our good works. We are saved for good works. Still in Ephesians 2, verse 10, we're told that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. So even though we're not saved by good works, we're saved for good works, which means that trusting in Christ isn't, isn't the finish line for us. It's really the starting line. Have you ever thought about that? It's not the finish line. It's the starting line. And so that means that when we pray for people, we're also praying that, you know, once they become a Christian, that they live a life that's engaged in good works, that they bear fruit. All right? So what's the first one? Fruit. The other kind of fruit that he describes is up in verse 6. He says that the gospel is bearing fruit. Well, what does he mean by fruit in that verse? So obviously it's referring to Christians who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ that others would come to faith in him. We call that evangelism. We call that witnessing, bearing fruit. So when you're praying for other believers, we should pray that they boldly talk to other people about Jesus. That God would give them a powerful witness and give them opportunities to, to talk to other people about Jesus. Uh, I heard a disturbing statistic recently about evangelism that according to a study that was done in evangelical churches, we would consider ourselves to be an evangelical church, a church that, that elevates Jesus and, and preaches according to the word of God. But a study that was done in evangelical churches says that millennials, millennials would be people in their, what, late 20s, early 30s? Amanda, are you a millennial? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, not to put you on the spot. In the, this isn't her. She's in the other percentage that I'm going to tell you. But in their study, 47% um, of millennials do not believe in sharing the gospel. And you can imagine why that is. 
Um, they go even go so far as to say they believe that sharing the gospel is morally wrong because it's imposing your beliefs onto somebody else. Isn't that the way of our world today? We don't want to impose our beliefs on other people. And it's like, seriously, how is the gospel going to spread if we don't tell other people about Jesus? You know, I've used this illustration before too, but if you discovered a cure for cancer, wouldn't you want to go out and tell all of your friends? I mean, you would want them to, to try that, that same cure for themselves, right? That if you didn't do that, if you held that to yourself, People would be all over you saying, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us? Well, it's the same with the gospel. You know, we have Jesus is the cure for eternal death. He's the only one who can give us eternal life. We need to be telling other people about that. And so this is another thing that I pray for all of you. After I give God thanks for you, I also pray that he gives you opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. Is that prayer being answered? I think it is. I hear stories of, of how you're doing that. And um, so that's an important thing. Paul prays that the gospel um, might be, bear fruit in our lives and, and throughout the world. So after giving thanks, um, what do we pray for again? We pray for fruit. Fruit in good works. Fruit in sharing the gospel. The second thing that we pray for is knowledge. All right? Say that with me. Fruit and knowledge. That's where we're at. Remember your memorizing these. Fruit and knowledge. Say it out loud. Fruit and knowledge. Okay? Let's go back to verse 10. After Paul prays that the Colossians would be bearing fruit, the second thing he prays for is that they would increase in the knowledge of God. So what does the knowledge of God mean? For many of us, we, we associate knowledge with facts. Right? So for followers of Jesus, knowledge is growing in facts and knowledge about the Bible. So we um, get a nice study Bible. I know many of you have that. We join a Bible study. We do daily devotions. We listen to podcasts. We maybe do some journaling. And before we know it, we know a lot of stuff about God, right? We know a lot of facts. We know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We maybe even begin to understand the doctrine of the Trinity and the supremacy of God. We know the signs of the end times and Daniel and Revelation. I mean, we get to know a lot of stuff, right? But according to scripture, that's not the end goal of knowledge. Right? Go back to the middle of verse 9. Paul says that from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that we may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? Verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Paul prays that as the Colossians grow in their knowledge of God, that this knowledge would produce lives that are worthy and pleasing to God. In other words, Paul isn't praying just for knowledge. He is, he's praying for applied knowledge. Knowledge that shapes and transforms our lives. Friends, we can be in multiple Bible studies, you know? We can, we can learn a lot of stuff, but if we're not putting what we're learning into practice, if, if our multiple Bible studies aren't making a difference in our families or in our workplace or how we steward our financial resources or whether we're taking time to serve in the church, then what we ought to do is stop stop taking one of those Bible studies and start to apply what we already know. All right? The Bible isn't about knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's about knowledge in the way that it shapes our lives. It's applied knowledge. That the knowledge of God would lead them to lives that are worthy and pleasing to God. Now, the fact that Paul is, is praying for this it kind of implies that it, it's possible for a believer to not live a life that's, that's worthy and pleasing to God, right? Doesn't that kind of imply that? And the reason I bring that up is, is that there is a false teaching out there, too, that goes around in, in some Christian circles. It says that once you surrender your life to Christ, that 
God then sees you in Christ. You know, you're, you're, you're blameless and spotless in Christ. In fact, we, we talked about that. We just talked about that last week, saying that that is how we will stand before God. But I'm not contradicting myself here, because what the false teaching wrongly assumes is that because of that, because we stand spotless and blameless before God, that how you live your life doesn't matter. Think about it. If that were the case, there would be no reason to pray, for, for Paul to be praying that they would live lives worthy and pleasing to God if it didn't matter. So there's a theology lesson for us here in that there is a big difference between our positional status before God and our practical status before God. Okay, positionally speaking, it is absolutely true that once we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we're not only forgiven of all of our sins, but we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We stand completely spotless and blameless before God. And that is an awesome thing to know. Because when we mess up in our life, which I do frequently, it's really comforting to be able to come before God and know that I am clothed in the righteousness of of Christ. So positionally speaking, it is absolutely true that we are worthy, we are pleasing to God in Christ. But practically speaking, I could still live a life that's not worthy, a life that's displeasing to God in my attitude, in my words, in my actions. And so Paul prays that the, that the Colossians, that they wouldn't take that path. He prays that their attitudes and their priorities and their behaviors and their relationships and what they choose for entertainment, that, that, that all of that will be worthy and pleasing to God. And so again, a good intercessor prays that their Christian friends and family will put their Bible knowledge into practice, that they'll not just know a whole bunch of facts and be a big Bible dictionary, but that their knowledge would be applied to their lives. Okay, so what do we pray for? We pray for fruit. We pray for knowledge. Thirdly, we pray for power. Let's line those up. Fruit, knowledge, power. There you go. Verse 11, Paul says that being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. So Paul prays that God will give the Colossians power. Power for what? Endurance and patience. That God would give power for endurance and patience. Now those two words, they kind of look like synonyms, don't they? Kind of synonym is two words that mean kind of the same thing. But in the original Greek language, they have different shades of meaning, and, and this is really important for us to know. Whereas endurance has to do with adverse circumstances, patience has to do with difficult people, okay, in the original Greek. So when we pray that God will empower our friends and family members with endurance, what we're praying for is that they'll be able to persevere through adverse circumstances. Like when they can't find a job, or when they're struggling with an illness, or when they or their loved ones are struggling with addiction. Those are adverse circumstances. And so in those situations, we pray, God, give them power for endurance for my friends. All right? Notice that, God, that, that Paul doesn't pray here for God to just take them quickly out of their circumstances. That's kind of how we pray, right? When somebody's struggling, we say, take it away, Lord, just take it away. Paul doesn't pray that way. Because sometimes, much to our dismay, God doesn't want to risk us out of our problems, does he? He wants us, sometimes he wants us to give us power to endure, power to persevere, power to trust him, power to grow in the midst of our trials. And so one of the things we can pray for people in adverse circumstances is God, give them power to endure. Give them power to persevere. The other thing that we pray for is power for patience. And that has to do with difficult people. Kind of gives a different uh, 
slant to it, doesn't it, Lauren? Lauren's the one who prays for patience for me all the time. <laughs> so, we, so we pray that God will empower our family and friends with patience. For instance, like when their boss is being overbearing, right? Or when they're fighting with their spouse or when their best friend just gossiped about them or when their child or grandchildren are going through, are rebelling or going through that or when their neighbor's dog habitually starts barking at 5.30 a.m. every single morning. You know, we pray God give them power to have patience with the difficult people in, your li in their lives. No elbow communication there. All right. So who do you know? Who do you know that needs God's power for endurance in adverse circumstances? Who do you know that needs God's power today for patience with difficult people? Who comes to mind? You know, those are the people that you can pray for. Those are the people that you can pray that God would give them the power to endure and be patient. All right, so fruit, knowledge, power. The last one is thanksgiving. Again. Thanksgiving. Amen. Can you say all of them with me, Bobby? Fruit. Fruit. fruit knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. Power. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Amen. If anybody has any questions, Amen. you know who to go to. Remind me. I find it very interesting that Paul wraps up this section with the very same thing that he started with giving thanks for thanksgiving. In, in fact, Paul talks about thanksgiving six times in this short letter of four chapters. So obviously thanksgiving is something that we as believers need prayer for. Why? Because sometimes Christians, even though we're Christians, um, aren't the most grateful people on the planet, are we? <laughs> We can be argumentative, we can be pessimistic, we can be uh, sarcastic, we can be grumpy, we can be cynical and discontent. Um, and when we see that in each other, that's not to give us cause to go and um, judge one another or scold each other. It's, it's a call to pray for one another, to, that we would be a thankful people. What do we as Christians have to be thankful for? Well, let's go back to the text one more time. The closing verses for this introduction, um, they really kind of deserve their own sermon, but uh, we're just going to go through it very quickly. Verses 12 to 14, Paul says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So three things that we as Christians can be thankful for, to God for. Number one is inheritance. Inheritance. Look at verse 12. God has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his kingdom. Now Paul is using some Old Testament imagery here. He's bringing to mind the story in the Old Testament that God's people are delivered or have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. God sends them a deliverer, Moses, who leads them to the promised land. And when they get to the promised land, that's where they receive their inheritance. Everybody gets their own property. They, they get their uh, own home. They, they receive an inheritance. Well, you get to the New Testament, and it's a similar story. We're not enslaved to Egypt. Rather, we are enslaved to sin, and the penalty of sin is death. God sends a deliverer. He sends Jesus, who comes and gives us life through the cross. And if we simply put our faith and trust in him, we get delivered from slavery to sin, and we receive the promise of our ultimate inheritance given to us in the eternal promised land. Amen? That is something to thank God for, is it not? Yes, we need to thank God for that. But do we do it? Do we thank God for that on a regular basis? Or do we just take it for granted? Most of us, I think, thank God. Thank you for the warm weather today. Thank you for the rain that we got. You know, Thank you that I got raised at work. Those are the things that we tend to thank God for. But man, I tell you, um, 
the intercessory prayer, giving God thanks is about a whole lot better stuff than that. You know, it's about significant stuff like eternal inheritance. Uh, second thing to thank God for is deliverance. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. More Old Testament imagery here of the same story when God set out to deliver his people out of Egypt. Pharaoh didn't, he didn't want him to let him go, right? He needed some convincing to let God's people go. And so God sent ten plagues. One of the plagues was a plague of darkness, deep, dark, terrifying darkness. They could not see him uh, even in front of their face. But God used that darkness to deliver them out of Egypt and eventually to the promised land. Well, we were also once caught in spiritual darkness, where we were unable to even see our need for salvation. You know, we, we couldn't even see why a relationship with God was so necessary. But then God, he, he shines his light into that heart darkness, into our dark hearts, so that we could see our need. And he gave us understanding and, and the conviction to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. And in doing so then, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. Is that something to give God thanks for? Yes, it is. All right? The third thing that we as Christians can give God thanks for, of course, is our forgiveness. Is forgiveness. Verse 14, again, in Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Friends, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your sin has been nailed to the Christ cross, and you bear it no, no more. You are forgiven of your sin. With that, guys, believers should be the most thankful people on this earth. We ought to be thankful, and when we pray for others, whether it's your kids or your family or your brothers and sisters in Christ or your co-workers or your neighbors, whoever it is, pray that God would make them thankful people, that they would give thanks to God. So what are the four things? Fruit, knowledge, power, and thanksgiving. All right? Fruit and our good deeds and our winsome testimony and sharing the gospel, knowledge, which isn't just a bunch of facts, but applied knowledge and living out and obeying the truths that we're learning. Power to endure adverse circumstances and to be patient with difficult people. Always, always overflowing with thanksgiving for the promises that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to give you a challenge. Right now, before we stand and pray, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind three people that we can specifically pray for this week. That we can go to God on their behalf and intercede using some of these tools that we just learned. Giving God thanks, just thanking God first, and then praying for those three people. That fruit would come forth in their life, that they would grow in the knowledge of the Lord, that they would give them power to endure and to be patient, and that they would become thankful people. Amen? Can we do that? I'll let you stand. Well, Father God, um, it is both a privilege and a duty to intercede on behalf of those among us and around us. People that we know, people that we don't know, just like Paul was praying for the Colossians. He didn't know them, but he was interceding for them. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you bring to mind to us right now at least three people that we can just pray, bring, bring them to you this over the course of this next week, that we would just take a few minutes every day to pray for them, God, to bring their needs before you, to pray that fruit would come forth in their life, that they would grow in their knowledge of you, that, they, that you would give them power to endure and have patience with situations in their lives and the people in their lives, and that you would make them thankful people. God, I stand on behalf of the people that are before me, and I pray that for all of them, for each one that is here.
here this morning for each one, too, that may be listening online. God, I thank you. I thank you for them. I thank you that you have brought them here. I thank you for what you are doing in their lives. I thank you for how the gospel is, is coming forth in their lives in and through them. And Lord, I pray that you would bless them, that they would bear fruit in all their good works, Lord. I pray that you would give them a great testimony and that you would give them opportunities, Lord, to share that testimony, that the gospel might bear fruit in their lives. And Lord, I do pray that, that they would grow in their knowledge of you and that they would be able to take that knowledge, all that they are learning, that they'd be able to apply it to their lives, to believe that it's true for them and that you give them power for transformation in their lives. Lord, I pray um, for power to endure the difficult situations that they're facing, whatever that may be. I pray that you give them power and patience to deal with the difficult people in their lives, Lord God. And Lord, I do pray that you would put thankfulness in their hearts, Lord, that they would, be, that they would live each and every day thankful for life, for breath, for Jesus, for the many blessings that you give them, for all good things, Lord God. Make them thankful people. Lord, I pray, too, for anyone who, who doesn't know you yet, Lord, as their Lord and Savior, I do pray that today would be the day that they would see their need for you, that you would shine your light into the darkness of their hearts, Lord, and that they would that you would lift that veil, that they would see their need for a Savior, that you would shine your light on Jesus, who is that Savior, that they might surrender to him, Lord God, and live for him, that they might be forgiven and receive all the blessings of eternal life, which we are so grateful for. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, we lift up to you all who have faithfully and, and courageously served for the freedom of, that we enjoy in this country. Lord, we pray um, that, the, that the fruit of their service and um, their courage, the sacrifices that they made, um, those who, who died in battle, Lord God, for the freedom of our country, we pray that that would continue to bear fruit, that their sacrifices would not be in vain, but that we would continue to enjoy the freedoms here in, the, in America and around the world. Lord, we pray for those who are currently serving God. We pray that you would strengthen them, that you would um, use wherever they are, Lord God, that, that you would bear fruit in their lives, that they would grow them out in their knowledge of you, that you would give them power to endure and to have patience, and that you would make them thankful. Comfort their families. Um, we pray the same for them. But we thank you for them. We ask your blessing to be upon them. We ask that you bring them safely home. And God, we pray that you would continue to instill the desire to serve uh, our country, to, to keep the freedoms that we have. So on this important weekend, Lord God, we remember those who have served. We remember also loved ones that have gone before us, Lord, and the memories that we have of them, we just ask, again, we thank you for them and ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we, again, we just uh, thank you for the season that we're in, a season of new life as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the Holy Spirit coming alive in us. We thank you for the life that we have with you. Thank you for the light that is new light that is coming forth in our world in the springtime and the plantings, God. And, and we just pray that you would bless that and, and grow all of that, Lord, into a bountiful harvest for your kingdom and for the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for our ministry partners, Lord. Pray that you would strengthen them, that um, they would continue to bear fruit for the gospel in their respective areas. We pray for Pastor Bob and for our time with him next week. We pray for um, Pastor Seaman and the work that he's doing in uh, Estonia and pray that he would meet their financial needs as well as their spiritual needs. We also lift up Enrique to you. We thank you for him and ask your blessing to be upon him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift
lift up those among us who are in need of your healing power. We specifically lift up to you uh, Bobby Thompson, Sylvia Smillen, Jean and Audrey Larson, Mary Schwartz, uh, Pastor Dave Stephenson, Dawn Armstrong, Doug Matthews, Mike Thompson, and those that we now name out loud are in the silence of our hearts. Lord, we bring their needs before you. We ask that you would heal them, bring forth your power, body, mind, and spirit, that you would finish the work that you have started in them and bring complete and perfect healing in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy. All these things we lift up to you, Jesus, who is really the great intercessor for all of us, God, who prays perfectly to our Heavenly Father on our behalf. And so it's in that that we come to you and pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. we go, let's play it, pray our sending prayer. Loving and gracious Lord, we go as co-laborers with you to complete your work in this world. Strengthen us and empower us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose love transforms us, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose presence guides us, that your name be made known. And as we go, receive God's blessing. May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We will close in singing. Uh, song uh, for God's blessing upon our country and in honor of our uh, people who have served so beautiful for such a size.